Well, a very good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Bates, and I'm the Managing Director here at Workforce Guardian from ADP. And it's certainly my pleasure to have your company this afternoon for our webinar entitled WHS, or Workplace Health and Safety for Beginners. Thanks to all of you who have arrived uh, well and truly on time. Uh, you're smack bang on uh, 12 midday Australian Eastern Daylight Time, so uh, we will be uh, uh, starting very shortly. I should say Australian Eastern Standard Time, shouldn't I? Haven't uh, quite gotten to summer time yet, although it's not too far away. Um, but for those of you who are in Sydney, uh, <laughs> you might have a difference of opinion. Uh, it's uh, blowing an absolute gale here, so if you do hear any uh, background noise during the course of the webinar today. Chances are it's just the uh, background noise being caused by this uh, rather turbulent weather. So I apologise in advance if you can hear any background noise as we go through the webinar today. Well, I am going to kick off in about 30 seconds or so. For those of you who are already on the line, you might just want to grab a pen and paper if you haven't already, just so that you can take some notes as we go through the webinar today. Uh, as the Heading suggests we'll be taking you through an overview of Australia's workplace health and safety laws. And just by way of background, one key point to note is that we will be talking today about the national workplace health and safety system, which means that it applies right across the country apart from Victoria and Western Australia. So if you're joining us today from either of those two states, do stay with us, um, but do just keep in mind that your state legislation is somewhat different. Um, the general principles are the same, but there are some differences and it is important that you obtain uh, specific advice for your own jurisdiction if you are in Victoria or WA. All right, well, I can see the last few people now are just signing in. I'm only waiting for a handful more, um, but uh, I'm not going to hold you up. Uh, all of you who've already joined us, it's great um, that you've, as I said, been uh, able to join us on time. So without any further ado, I am going to get stuck straight into today's webinar. So for those of you who are first timers joining us here for this Workforce Guardian from ADP webinar series, just allow me to take 30 seconds or so to quickly explain the relationship between Workforce Guardian and ADP. So Workforce Guardian is a standalone subscription-based HR service. We were specifically built to make it easy for primarily small and medium-sized businesses to comply with Australian employment and workplace health and safety laws. Now our service, as I said, is standalone, but we're very proud to partner with ADP, and that makes it possible for ADP subscribers to, or ADP clients, I should say, to also subscribe to the Workforce Guardian service. And you can, in fact, subscribe to our service via ADP itself. So you can simply get in touch with ADP once you become a client, and then you can subscribe via ADP to the Workforce Guardian online HR system. And once you have the online Workforce Guardian from ADP system, you'll have everything you need to hire, manage and dismiss employees with absolute confidence. You'll be able to easily generate all of the contracts of employment that you need using our industry leading employment contract wizard. You'll be able to receive as well unlimited online employment advice and support from our team of very friendly and knowledgeable experts. You can safely store all of your employment related records, including for example, medical certificates, contracts, letters of warning, etc., on the Workforce Guardian from ADP system. And apart from anything else, you'll enjoy complete peace of mind because you'll know that everything you're doing is compliant with the Fair Work Act. Our service is brought to you in conjunction with Clayton Utes. They verify all of our online content so you can rest assured that everything on our system is fully compliant with the legislation that applies here in Australia. So uh, if you are interested in the Workforce Guardian from ADP service, do get in touch with ADP. They'd certainly be able to uh, provide you with more information. And it certainly is our pleasure to work in partnership with the team over at ADP. One other thing to mention is that if you are an ADP client, regardless of whether you have a subscription as well with Workforce Guardian, you have access to the dedicated workplace advice line that's provided by Workforce Guardian free of charge to all ADP Australian clients. And that service enables you to obtain up to 15 minutes of free advice per topic per call. So if you uh, need to call us once a week, but each time it's on a different matter, that's perfectly fine. You'll get up to 15 minutes each time completely free of charge. And the vast majority of ADP clients are able to resolve their HR issue in a lot less than 15 minutes. So that's a really fantastic service that ADP provides to its Australian based clients. And it's certainly a service that we're proud to provide to ADP clients. So 
Overview of today's webinar. What are we going to be discussing over the next half hour or so? Well, we're going to first of all start with a brief background of the employment laws in relation to workplace health and safety. So specifically, a little bit of an overview, if you like, about what Australian workplace health and safety law is all about. Then I'm gonna take you through what I call the six key concepts. And in fact, I've added another one in there. And so it really rounds up to seven. Um, but for the purposes of right now, I'll talk about the six key concepts that we're gonna go through. And they are really definitions, six definitions that you must have in order to then make sense of Australia's workplace health and safety laws. Because WHS, just like all other areas of law has a whole bunch of jargon, if you like, thrown in. And unless you're familiar with what that jargon actually means, it's gonna become very difficult to get your head around what the workplace health and safety laws are all about. So we'll go through that jargon, those, if you like, six or seven key concepts. We'll go through those at the beginning of the webinar to make sure that you're fully across what they're all about. Then we're gonna get into the substantive part of the webinar, where we're gonna talk about a summary of the key changes that have taken place as Australia moved to this new national workplace health and safety system. And then I'm gonna finish off with a brief mention of the various penalties that can be imposed on businesses which are not compliant with these new national workplace health and safety laws. So that's what we'll cover off in the next half hour. I do expect that we'll be done by somewhere around 12.30 to 12.40 p.m. So let's just have a quick uh, overview, if you like, of why it is that we have these new workplace health and safety laws here in Australia. Well, the first thing to note is that, of course, the nature of work here in Australia has changed quite significantly um, over the last few decades, for sure, but certainly even just over the last few years. As technology has changed and the way we work has changed, it became necessary for the workplace health and safety laws to be updated. And so what was done really was a generational change. It's something that governments, state and federal, had been looking at trying to make changes to for a very long time. And so the introduction of the National Workplace Health and Safety Laws um, by the previous uh, Rudd slash Gillard government really was quite a significant achievement because up until that point, Australia really did have disparate state and federal legislation, which caused a massive amount of confusion for employers. So quite apart from the fact that the nature of work in Australia is changing, we also know, of course, that workplaces themselves are diversifying. So for example, working from home is now far more common than it used to be. And that's because of things like Skype, uh, GoToWebinar that we're using today, email, uh, et cetera. So it's now easier than ever for employees to work from different locations, but the old workplace health and safety legislation didn't cover that. It hadn't kept up with the changing environment, if you like, in which people were working. So another good reason why we have this new National Workplace Health and Safety System is because of the changing uh, or diversifying way that Australians are doing business. Now, the other thing that's important to know here is that in alternative employment arrangements, that is arrangements other than an employer simply engaging an employee directly, are also becoming increasingly common. So gone are the days when everyone had a boss, bosses were managing a team of employees, some of those employees would have been managing a team below them, etc. Now that's quite common still in certain industries or certain occupations, public sector for example. But generally we have a significant change in the way that employment relationships are working. There are far more labour hire arrangements in place now. There is a huge number of independent contractors and indeed many people also volunteer their time. So those types of scenarios or arrangements really fell outside of that traditional concept of employer and employee. And as a result, the legislation had to be updated to make sure that it was properly regulating and capturing, if you like, all of these new types of arrangements. And it won't uh, surprise you to learn that our nation's laws were not consistent. So each state was doing its own thing. The Commonwealth government was doing its own thing as well. So what came about during that Rudd-Gillard era was a focus on producing or implementing a new national workplace health and safety system. 
and you'll see that the old acronym OHS has now effectively been replaced by WHS. That's what you'll see through all of the current contemporary literature about Australia's workplace health and safety system. So a national workplace health and safety system was introduced back in January 2012. Now that surprises some people because they don't realise that this has been in place now for a few years already, but indeed it has. And the way that the laws were introduced was a little bit different from the way that most laws are introduced. Australians are more used to the Commonwealth Government simply stepping in and passing a piece of national legislation, which then becomes binding on everyone. And a good example of that is the Fair Work Act of 2009. That was Commonwealth legislation that was introduced. It effectively brought all of these uh, state, uh, inconsistent state employment laws into uh, one place, into the Fair Work Act, if you like. And as a result, we had consistent laws right across the country. Now, that's not what happened with the workplace health and safety system. Instead of states transferring their powers to the Commonwealth, as they did with employment law, so New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, for example, transferred their state-based workplace relations powers to the Commonwealth and then became part of the national fair work system. That didn't happen with workplace health and safety for a number of reasons, but instead what happened was each state and territory government was asked to amend their own laws to ensure consistency with what became known as the model workplace health and safety laws. So the Commonwealth Government introduced a model workplace health and safety act, and then each state and territory was asked to change its own laws so that those state-based or territory-based laws effectively mirrored the new national legislation. And that process was what we refer to now as harmonisation. So the graphic on your screen now from left to right effectively shows what happened. States and territories took their existing safety legislation. They passed specific uh, amendments in their own states and territories to bring those specific acts into line with the new national legislation. And as a result, the state and territory legislation now mirrors that National Workplace Health and Safety Act, with the consequence being that now we effectively have one national system of workplace health and safety laws. The legislation is effectively the same right across the country, with two exceptions, because we wouldn't be Australia without some states choosing to go their own way. So what happened is all states and territories have now adopted this model workplace health and safety system, except for Victoria and Western Australia. Now importantly, Western Australia has indicated that it is committed in principle to adopting the draft legislation. So there is already, in fact, draft legislation currently being debated in WA, which if passed, will bring WA effectively into the new national workplace health and safety system. But until that happens, WA's old workplace health and safety laws continue to apply. And separately, again, in Victoria, well, the Victorian government has formally now refused to adopt the model workplace health and safety laws. So they're not going to be proceeding uh, with the national or model laws. And instead, Victoria is going to continue doing its own thing. So again, if you are based in WA or Victoria, although some of the principles that we'll be discussing today are quite relevant, it is still very important that you refer to your own state legislation because there are some significant differences. So do keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the webinar. Now, at the beginning of the webinar, I talked about um, six key concepts, if you like, six definitions that I think we need to go through. And as I said, I've actually added one to that now, and we call it the seven key concepts. So we'll go through each of these concepts one by one. Um, and really, what I'd just like you to do is take some notes or just keep in mind what each of these concepts means. We'll go through them in a lot more detail in a moment, but it is essential that we at least cover off these first seven key concepts before we go any further. The first of these concepts is what's called a PCBU, which stands for a person conducting a business or undertaking. Now, the term PCBU can be a little bit confusing because it has the word P in it, or the letter P in it, for the word person. But in fact, a PCBU is often not a person. It's the organisation itself. So it has a very strict and very complex, really, legal definition. But the key point to note here about a person conducting a business or an undertaking is that that entity is really at the top of the food chain when it comes to the workplace health and safety laws. Note also 
that it's not just a person conducting a business, but it also captures an undertaking. And that is important because an undertaking is generally uh, used, that term is generally used to define a business which isn't for profit. So an undertaking could be a not-for-profit community organisation. And the key thing to note is, as you can see, that organisation has now been brought in to the workplace health and safety laws. So there can be no doubt anymore that a business that is not for profit or which doesn't fit the traditional definition of business, that, excuse me, there can be no doubt that they are in fact now captured by the workplace health and safety laws. So key definition number one, PCBU, person conducting business or undertaking, right at the top of the food chain. Now the reason that we need to know what the PCBU is, is because that PCBU has what is known as the primary duty. And the primary duty is really the most onerous workplace health and safety duty that exists under the legislation. So in a moment, I'll show you a new graphic which brings all of these things into a um, visual form. But for now, just note that the PCBU has what is known as the primary duty of care. And within that primary duty of care, there's a definition of what that primary duty is all about, which again, we'll look at in a moment. But the key thing to note at this point is that the primary duty of care is subject to a qualifier. And that qualifier is the term reasonably practicable. So an employer or the PCBU to be specific, the PCBU has the primary duty of care, but that primary duty of care is subject to the qualifier of only having to do things which are reasonably practicable. And again, we'll go through that all in just a moment. So that's the first set of three key concepts. So the primary duty and the definition of reasonably practicable, they fall under that heading of the PCBU. But within an organization, within the PCBU, there are other people who are called officers. And officers are defined by the Corporations Act and effectively they're senior managers who have the ability to influence decision-making around workplace health and safety. So it's quite a broad definition again. So a senior manager who can influence decisions relating to workplace health and safety, those people are called officers. And just as the PCBU has a specific duty, officers also have a specific duty. And theirs is called the duty of due diligence. And again, we'll go through that in a lot more detail in just a moment. So within the organization, we've got the PCBU, we've got officers, and then we have what are called the workers. And workers also have their own duty, and theirs is what's called the duty to take reasonable care. So you can see within each of these three sections, PCBU, officer, and worker, there is a corresponding duty that exists under the model workplace health and safety laws. The PCBU has this primary duty, the officer has the duty of due diligence and workers have an obligation to take reasonable care. One other key thing to note at this point is that when it comes to workers, workers has a very broad definition under the legislation. So workers are no longer limited only to people who are the traditional employees in a business. The term worker in fact now extends to people who are volunteers, independent contractors, effectively anyone who comes into the workplace. So it has a very broad definition, really key point to note about the new legislation. All right, so there are your six slash seven key concepts um, that I think we need to know about before we get stuck into anything else in this webinar. So now we're gonna go into the substantive changes that have taken place. So let's start with this concept of risk management before we get into the duties of each of these office holders. And by office holders, I'm referring, of course, to the PCBUs, the officers, etc. So the first thing to note is that there is this obligation, if you like, to manage risks and employers are required to, under this legislation, to continue securing the health and safety of employees and workplaces via a process of risk management. Now, risk assessments, that is going around your workplace to determine whether or not there are any risks, they are not mandated by the new act. So the national workplace health and safety laws don't formally require everyone to conduct a risk assessment. However, 
If your business operates in what's known as a high risk area or undertakes high risk activities, then the specific regulations that apply to your industry may in fact then impose an additional obligation to conduct risk assessments. But there is no generic obligation right across every employer to conduct risk assessments. But nonetheless, we are all required to continue securing the health and safety of workers. So with that in mind, and thinking of that as sort of the foundation upon which the rest of this system is built, let's have a think about each of these office holders and the duties that they have. So as I mentioned at the beginning, PCBUs have the highest level of responsibility. All those that are involved in the conduct of work have this duty to ensure health and safety and to eliminate or minimise risks to health and safety so far as is reasonably practicable. So again, I really want to emphasise that although the PCBU has a very onerous duty, this duty, um, if you like, or the primary duty, I should say, of care, although they have this onerous duty, it is subject to this qualifier of only having to eliminate or minimise risks so far as is reasonably practicable. So what that means is that a PCBU is not required to remove every conceivable risk from the workplace because doing so would not be reasonably practicable. So using a stapler could be dangerous, but it's not necessary for the PCBU to put a bubble wrap around every stapler in your office, training, train staff on how to use a stapler, put up a list of steps to be followed when a stapler is used, etc. That would be overkill. So the legislation now recognises that and it makes it clear that the PCBU only has to eliminate or minimise risks so far as is reasonably practicable. So let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail. The de definition, if you like, of what is reasonably practicable is helpfully provided in the legislation itself. And what it does is it contains a list of factors that the PCBU needs to consider when deciding whether or not something is or is not reasonably practicable in the circumstances. So things to consider include the likelihood of harm, the degree of harm that would be caused by an incident, what is known about the hazards or risks and how they can be eliminated or minimised, the availability as well as the suitability of the different methods that are available to eliminate or minimise risks, and also after a full assessment, whether the cost is grossly disproportionate to the risk itself. So, using the stapler example again, if we were to identify that, yes, there are risks of using a stapler in the workplace, the question we could ask at the beginning is, well, what's the likelihood of there being an injury? And I'd say that it's pretty low. The stapler is used properly, people aren't really going to be injured. And if they were injured using a stapler, how injured are they likely to be? Well, they're not going to lose an arm. <laughs> that's, that's good to know. So the degree of harm is pretty low. We also know that people generally know how to use a stapler, so it's not that risky. There are certainly ways that we could eliminate or minimise risks. We could, as I said before, put the stapler in bubble wrap, put up instructions, provide formal training, etc. But if we were to think about all of those things, what we would probably determine is that the costs and time involved would be grossly disproportionate to the risk posed by that stapler. So just because there is a risk, it does not require the PCBU to absolutely do everything possible to get rid of it or minimise it. Instead, they simply have to do what's reasonably practicable. Now, we know, of course, that using a stapler is a you know a very simple example. Clearly, there are significant workplace health and safety risks in many workplaces. So if you were working in a mechanic store, um, you'd know that you're hoisting vehicles up and down, people could be crushed, there could be uh, injuries caused by equipment that's being used on the car, etc. So every workplace will have its own unique risks. But again, the employer in each scenario, the PCBU in each scenario, must only do what is reasonably practicable in the circumstances. So now we know about the PCBU and this primary duty of care. What about officers? Because most people who are in senior managerial positions and who influence decisions will be classified, if you like, or will meet the definition of an officer. And as we see on this screen, Officers are generally senior managers with decision-making responsibilities and importantly, 
if someone is an officer, under the current legislation, it is simply not possible for that person to delegate their obligations or to delegate their duty of due diligence to anyone else. So if someone is an officer, they can't simply say, well, I nominate Bob to be my default officer and I give Bob full authority and responsibility for workplace health and safety. That simply does not work under the legislation. Whether a person is an officer is a matter of law and accordingly that officer, if they are an officer, then has legal responsibilities that they cannot get out of. There's no option. So it can't be delegated, can't get out of them. So now that we know who officers are, and we know that officers have this specific duty that we mentioned before, the duty of due diligence, it's important to actually unpack what this duty is all about. So the duty of due diligence is somewhat less onerous than the primary duty of care that we looked at before, but it still does require officers to do certain specific things. So it involves a positive duty. To exercise due diligence requires all officers to do a number of specific things, and I've listed six of them on the screen there for you. The first is officers must acquire and keep up to date a full knowledge of the workplace health and safety laws. It doesn't mean they have to become lawyers by default, but they certainly need to understand what their general obligations are. They need to understand the nature of the operations, hazards and risks in the business in which they work. So an officer has again a proactive obligation to make sure that they do understand the operations, hazards and risks across their business. And they need to do something more than just have an awareness of it. They also need to use appropriate resources to eliminate or minimize those risks. They also need to put into place appropriate processes for receiving and considering information about workplace health and safety and responding to that information in a timely manner. So officers should ensure that the workplace has a process in place for people to bring complaints or to bring suggestions relating to workplace health and safety and to have those complaints and suggestions dealt with appropriately. And then as a further step, officers are also required under the duty of due diligence to implement processes to ensure compliance. And one of the things that they can do, of course, is also verify that risks and hazards are being appropriately controlled across the workplace. So you can see there are a number of specific, expressly specific things that officers are legally required to do under this legislation in order to meet their duty of due diligence. And critically, I have to emphasize again that officers cannot delegate their workplace health and safety responsibilities to anyone else. So if you are an officer, you need to do those six things as an absolute minimum. And if I were you, I'd keep written records of the steps that you've taken to ensure that there is some sort of proof that you are fulfilling your duty of due diligence as an officer. So now we've covered off the PCBU and the primary duty of care. We've talked about officers and the duty of due diligence. It's important just at this point to note that one question that often comes up is, does a business have to appoint people with specific workplace health and safety responsibilities? And the answer, quite clearly under the model legislation adopted all across the country except in Victoria and WA, is no. That obligation does not exist under the legislation. Now what is important to point out is that workers are entitled to request the appointment or election of a workplace health and safety representative but it's not a mandatory requirement for employers to proactively appoint workplace health and safety representatives. That is a key distinction. So just to clarify that again, employees can certainly ask or request for a workplace health and safety representative to be elected, but employers are generally under no obligation to proactively appoint someone unless that request has been made. Now at the beginning of the webinar, I emphasized that the term worker has a far broader definition under the current legislation. So I just wanna emphasize that here on this particular screen. We know under the current legislation that the definition of a worker now certainly extends beyond the employment relationship, the traditional employer-employee relationship, and that it now includes anyone who effectively works in any capacity in or as part of the business. And that will certainly include volunteers, independent contractors, and others who come into the business. Now, all of those people who meet the definition of a worker have a duty as well, just like the PCBU and officers do. 
the obligation for workers or the duty for workers, if you like, is to take reasonable care of their own health and safety and to make sure that others are not adversely affected by their own acts and omissions. Now that comes down to a number of practical things that they should do, but certainly two clear things that they must do is comply with instructions as far as they're reasonably able and to cooperate with any reasonable policies or procedures that are in place relating to workplace health and safety. So a worker can't simply come into the workplace, behave in a really egregious way, really dangerous way, do all kinds of dangerous things, and then blame a um, WHS consequence that arises from their action on an officer or on the PCBU. They can certainly try and lay that blame, but at the end of the day, if they haven't exercised reasonable care themselves, then they will also be liable for any breach of the workplace health and safety obligations. So very clear and very important, workers also have an obligation, they have a duty under the national legislation. Now all of these people, all of these duty holders are required to consult and consultation is a key part of the national workplace health and safety system. Now where there are multiple duty holders, they must consult, cooperate and coordinate with each other. And they also need to then consult with workers. So if there are a number of people who comprise the PCBU, and then of course there are all of the different officers, all of those people must consult, cooperate and coordinate to ensure that risks are minimized or avoided at all costs subject of course to that limit or that qualifier of being reasonably practicable. Now a breach of the consultation provisions can carry significant penalties under the national legislation. So duty holders really should be encouraged to make sure that they undertake training or that they at least understand their core obligations. Because if they don't realize that they have these duties attached to their roles, then chances are they're not complying excuse me, they're not complying with those duties. So it's critical that officers and PCBUs understand the primary duty and the duty of due diligence. Now, as I mentioned before, the current laws do still allow or still maintain the existing provisions that arose under the old state legislation for workers to elect health and safety representative. And those representatives are empowered under the new legislation to represent workers in what's called their work group. So each workplace health and safety representative represents a specifically defined work group. These representatives are also given quite significant legal powers under the new national workplace health and safety laws. They can, for example, issue what are known as provisional infringement notices or pins to employers, to their own employer, if they believe that there is a breach of the workplace health and safety laws. And they also have the combined power to direct that unsafe work cease. Now these powers are subject to the workplace health and safety representative having completed particular training, but it still remains the case that they are significant powers. Now quite apart from workplace health and safety representatives, who as I mentioned before, don't have to automatically be appointed by employers unless an employee has requested their election. Quite apart from those health and safety representatives, workers still of course also have the right to cease unsafe work if they believe it's necessary. So no worker in Australia is required to follow instructions where there is a reasonable risk to their health and safety if they do follow those instructions. Also worth keeping that in mind. Now, all of these things, all of these duty holders, the duties themselves, etc., they all are there in relation to workplace health and safety issue management. That's their primary purpose. And so what the legislation also does is it actually defines the term issues. And it says an agreed issue resolution procedure must be in place in each business. And if one has not been put into place, then the model issue resolution procedure, which is found in that model national legislation, will apply by default. So critical to note that if you are covered by this law, even if you haven't put into place your own issue resolution procedure, one will simply be read in by the national legislation. And whenever um, that issue resolution procedure is required or invoked, it's really important to know that health and safety representatives, if there are any, cannot by law be excluded 
from the issue resolution procedure. They effectively have a statutory right to take part. Now I'm sure it won't surprise you that under the national legislation, any discrimination, coercion, inducement or misrepresentation that prevents a person from being involved with the protection of their safety is strictly prohibited. So the legislation makes it clear that workers and office holders have particular rights and responsibilities, and these cannot be undermined, if you like, by discriminatory, uh, coercive or misleading conduct. And unions, interestingly, also have specific rights when it comes to workplace health and safety too. So union members who hold a workplace health and safety entry permit are able to enter a workplace to advise and assist in any WHS reason or purpose, or to investigate a suspected contravention of the legislation. Now, if they're entering the workplace to engage in consultation um, or advocacy, then they have to give 24 hours advance notice. However, if they suspect that there is a contravention, then under the Act, they can come in without notice. Really important to note that union members may also enter a site for the purpose of assisting an appointed health and safety representative or to attend those meetings in relation to resolving workplace health and safety issues. So some quite significant legal entitlements there for union officials, provided they have the appropriate qualifications and permits. Now, we're getting towards the end of the summary of changes, so just two further things I'd like to point out here. There is a concept in the legislation of what are known as serious and notifiable incidences. If there is a serious or a notifiable incident within the workplace, then there is an obligation to notify the relevant regulator, and I'll talk about who those are in just a moment, and also a legal obligation to preserve the incident seen until an inspector from that regulator attends, or they expressly give permission for the site to no longer be preserved. So if you're not already across what would amount to a serious or notifiable incident, it is important to check with your own regulator in your state so that you know when you would be legally required to contact them if something happened in your workplace. And finally here, I'm sure again, it won't surprise you to know that there are significant penalties that will apply for non-compliance. And we'll have a look at those in just a second. So what you're seeing on your screen now are, are a list of all of the regulators here in Australia. These are the state-based regulators. There's also a Commonwealth uh, regulator, um, which governs obviously employees who are covered by the Commonwealth system. But you can see there each of the state-based regulators. And if you don't already have their contact details as an employer, I do encourage you to make sure that you've got ready access to them just in case you ever need to get in touch with them. The one at the bottom right there, the Department of Commerce, that's in WA. So WorkSafe WA is effectively part of the Department of Commerce and you'll be able to find their website via the Department of Commerce's own website. So what are these penalties that I mentioned? Well, there are three different categories of penalty, really from most serious to least serious. So if you were to expose an employee to serious harm or even death through reckless behavior, that would be a category one breach. Category two breaches include exposing employees to serious harm through a failure to comply with health and safety regulations. And category three are all other workplace health and safety related offenses. Now the maximum penalties for the most serious breaches are up to five years in prison or a $600,000 fine. And the max, that's for an individual, of course. And the maximum penalty for a corporation is $3 million and the maximum financial penalty for an individual for a lower level breach is $300,000. So you can see we're not here you know, talking about small fries. These are extremely serious penalties. So workplace health and safety must be treated with the utmost seriousness in every business. So just to recap, key concepts. We've got the PCBU with that primary duty We've got officers with the duty of due diligence, and we have workers with this obligation to take reasonable care. Keep in mind that that primary duty that applies to PCBUs is subject to that qualifier of things which are reasonably practicable. And remember as well, the definition of worker is much broader than the old definition and captures a far, far wider range of people than the old state-based legislation did. 
One final piece of good news, the Workforce Guardian from ADP Service was upgraded earlier this year and now includes a comprehensive workplace health and safety centre. Everything you need for compliance with Australian workplace health and safety laws under this national system is included as part of your Workforce Guardian from ADP subscription. So again, another great reason why a subscription makes sense. Now, if you'd like to join us for the last two webinars in this 2015 webinar series, on the 22nd of October, we'll be talking about a guide to workplace bullying and stress. And then we're gonna finish off the year on the 26th of November with a webinar looking at how you can avoid the five most common HR mistakes here in Australia. So do join us for those two webinars. You can register for those online, just as you did for today's webinar. Now, for those of you who are ADP clients or prospective clients, you can always get in touch with ADP at adppayroll.com.au forward slash contact, or you can phone ADP on 1800 000 729. Certainly worth pointing out that if you're now interested in a Workforce Guardian from ADP subscription, contact ADP directly using those details and they'll certainly be able to assist you further. And remember, if you're already an existing ADP client, you can contact the ADP Workplace Advice Line anytime with your HR related questions. Remember, we don't deal with superannuation, taxation or salary sacrifice questions because they're not covered by employment law, but anything that's covered by the Fair Work Act effectively can be asked of our team. So our friendly team of experts are always happy to hear from you and the number is now on your screen. Well, before our office blows away in the Sydney weather, I am gonna wrap up uh, today's webinar. Thanks again for your company this afternoon. It's really been a pleasure to have you join me for this webinar, and I do hope you found it very useful. I also very much hope that you'll join us for those final two webinars of the year. This webinar series has proved very popular, and it would be fantastic to have your company for those last two as well. All that remains for me to say is on behalf of the entire team here at Workforce Guardian from ADP, thanks very much for your time, and I hope to speak to you again very soon. Bye for now.